I'm Rob LaCourie, a senior editor at Gold Derby here with Carl Urban, who co-stars as Billy Butcher in Amazon's blockbuster superhero action satire, The Boys. Carl, season two really focuses on Butcher's story. We start to learn more about what drives him, and uh, particularly as it relates to his wife and his lust for vengeance. Um, how satisfied were you with how season two panned out for Butcher? Yeah, I think season two um, was a phenomenal opportunity for both the writers and myself to, you know, further explore the depths of Butcher's character. Um, you know, in season one, obviously, he was set up as this uh, rough around the edges, um, uh, uh, sort of character that uh, had a sort of a Machiavellian way that was, you know, driven to do what he wanted to do, was very self-orientated in his goals and would spare no thought to anybody else's health or well-being in order to achieve what he wanted to achieve. In season two, there's quite a significant shift with the revelation that his wife, Becca Butcher, is still alive. Season two really humanizes Butcher in a way that we see a more desperate and vulnerable Butcher. Uh, we get to see Butcher in love. We get to see him deal with the pain that comes from uh, the woman that he loves dearly rejecting him because of who he is, because of those monsters and demons that reside deep within him. And then ultimately, you know, um, full spoilers, ultimately, you know, seeing Butcher have to deal with the tragedy at the, at the end of season uh, two um, and find himself in a position where he is, you know, now ostensibly, you know, uh, having to um, take responsibility for Homelanders and, and his wife's son. Uh, so there was a huge, you know, journey. And, and in my discussions with, with Eric, it was all, it was very much about, you know, humanizing him and sort of coming to a deeper understanding of of who he is and you know personally how I look at Butcher is you know that there is the sort of dual nature about him um, I do believe he has an inherent deep nobility it is buried and there is a war that is sort of is is raging within the character of Book Butcher and that's that that war of this sort of um you know, this, this beast that lives within him uh, rages with that morality and that is constantly um, a, a fun conflict to get the opportunity to, to play. Yeah, and what he does a lot is he tries to build those walls to hide his vulnerability. And that's why I found it immensely satisfying um, at the end. And it, by the way, people, if you haven't seen season two yet, go away, watch it, come back. Um, you gave such a compelling performance in the finale when you're holding Becca as she takes her last breaths. Um, it, it was devastating. Is, is vulnerability and grief difficult to get right as a performer? Well, here's the thing. Um, I cannot take full credit for, you know, the work that, that you see on screen as much as I'd like to. I'm blessed with the fact that I got to work with the amazingly talented Chantel Van Santen, who day in, day out, delivered a performance to me that made it very easy for me to work in the moment and to, to, to deliver an honest response to what I was being given. And it's like anybody will tell you, whether it's you're playing tennis or, or any game, you play better when somebody is playing better against you. And, and that's really kind of simply a case of what happened here. Obviously we benefited from great writing too. Um, but uh, you know, I will say about those scenes that they resonated in a way that really took me by surprise. I was shocked at how long after we had finished shooting them that they, the sort of emotional essence of those scenes and the shock and the pain was still with me. Um, and I hadn't actually really experienced that to that degree before in, in anything else that I've ever done. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised because um, as you say, Chantel brought so much to a role that could have been kind of a nothing really. She's um, a lot of what she's doing is, um, sorry, I'm just going to move this person out. 
Um, yeah, and so, as I was saying, um, she she brought a lot to this role. And when Butcher is reconnecting with Becca towards the middle of the season, we see a, a much lighter side to him. Uh, and I wondered, because in season one, there was it was it was so full on and so intense. You got to do some of that lighter stuff. I mean, without sounding like Captain Obvious, did you relish the opportunity to be able to do that? Uh, sorry, relish the opportunity to do what? To, to just play him to play those lighter moments which are with his wife yeah definitely i, I think some of um, my favorite experiences through shooting season two uh we're actually uh exploring more lighter side of butcher it's seeing butcher in love you know those simple little scenes like um butcher uh sitting in the back of um, becca's car and they've just made love and they're sharing a cigarette and it was that sort of unspoken familiarity and connection between the two characters how she would you know hand him a cigarette and without even taking it from her hands he would lean over and just take a drag and it, it's that kind of connective tissue that bonding that in that that action that speaks volumes about who these characters are to each other and um you know it was uh you know it, it was it was just i think wonderful to humanize the character like that and to you know, show a, a softer, more vulnerable side and, and a side that, you know, none of the other characters get to see. Yeah. You also got to um, have a, a really interesting uh, episode with John Noble, the legendary John Noble, who plays your dad, uh, Butcher's dad, sorry, I should say. Um, so again, like th there was more opportunity there to kind of dig a bit deeper into what is driving this guy because he's super angry super intense and you can you can kind of see well no shit look, look where he look what he came from is that what was playing in your mind when you were going through those scenes uh, when i'm in those scenes you know again I'm, I'm just blessed to with the benefit of having just being able to work in the moment with a character uh, with an actor of the caliber of john noble and and uh you know when he's pushing and shoving you it you can't help but you know push the right buttons in response um but certainly with regard to how those scenes actually inform the audience uh, to the character of Butcher, it is important to convey um, where this beast that resides within Butcher, the origin of that and the tragedy of, of Butcher's brother and, and what happened there and the resentment, the lifelong resentment that Butcher holds against his father and in some smaller degree against his mother. And that, you know, really that the, um, you know, that, 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 that damage is, is, is a huge part of, you know, Butcher's response to the tragedy that occurred um, with his wife and, and, and how he's a man who will not take it lying down. He's a man that is, is, is hell bent on getting retribution, is hell bent on, on, bent on getting, on getting justice. And he, has taken that fuel, all of that sort of toxic baggage from his life and has focused it on Homelander and on, 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 on getting his, on getting justice uh, against um, these, uh, these corrupt superheroes. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's why Butcher is such a badass and you're required to play him as violent and angry. And Homelander even calls him a man possessed halfway through the season. But sometimes when you're playing those, those scenes where, you know, Butcher is really, you know, beating someone up or he's um, trying to um, en enact his vengeance or justice, I can see this glimmer in your eyes where he's almost kind of enjoying it. But there's a there's there's a part of him that's just like I just want to fuck things up. But do, do you agree that that's what you're trying to do sometimes? Almost oh, definitely. That, that that that's a calibrated choice. I, I you know I want to intentionally signal to the audience: you better watch out when Butcher smiles when he's yeah. enjoying it. <laughs> it shit about to hit the wall and that was sort of reflected right back to the choices we made in season one where he has a fight with translucent and you know translucent is beating the crap out of him and there's this one point where you just see the smile and butcher and he's loving it he is just loving the opportunity to get all of that that anguish and that angst and that toxicity out of his 
body and from his from his entire life and take it out on on something and someone yeah because i mean we all kind of have a little bit about that in, in all of us i do um and you know but obviously not to that extreme and that's why i think i find which is so satisfying to watch um it, which brings me to this so um you don't play one of the soups but in this show, we, we see a lot of these people who are depicted as godlike celebrities who have gone rogue. And obviously, it's saying a lot about our celebrity culture and commoditization of celebrities and materialism, fame and greed and all that stuff. How do you how does that resonate with you, given that, you know, you've been working in Hollywood for such a long time and you've seen some of it for yourself? How do you think the show depicts that? Well, I think that, you know, one of the great... Um, elements of success about the boys is yes it is, it is this fun irreverent satirical look at superheroes and the nature of celebrity and you know if you choose you can just take it on that level but if you choose to delve deeper there is a, a sort of a, a layer of metaphor that is sort of speaking quite poignantly about the state of celebrity about the state of politics um, xenophobia, corporate greed, racism. And, and I believe that that is, you know, one of the ingredients that makes this show um, successful uh, because it's accessible to, to anybody uh, on any level that you choose. Uh, and I feel proud to be a, a part of a show that has the courage to, um, to speak up and, and to, to bring forth these topics, even if it is, you know, um, uh, disseminated in a way that is palatable, because we're talking about, you know, these things existing in an imaginary world, but it's very clear to see the parallels with our reality. Yeah, it is. And it's, it's oftentimes super funny. Um, the show can be really, really funny. Uh, it also can be super violent. And it's difficult for me to kind of enunciate exactly what I'm getting at here. But you, you know that the show is ultra violent, like it's almost ridiculous in how the heads explode and, and all that kind of stuff. And normally, we have to talk about violence as being nuanced, or, you know, uh, we have to be sensitive. But this show is not interested in doing that. How do you feel about how it's got to toe that line between being super entertaining and ridiculous and also not being too gratuitous but it kind of is how do i personally feel about yeah that? Like, yeah yeah well you know my my attitude towards <laughs> the violence on the show is the same as you know my personal opinion about any kind of action in any show it, if it goes to serve the narrative and it's not just gratuitous for the sake of gratuity then uh then I, you know, I'm, I'm all down with it. Um, obviously, I think there are times on this show where, um, you know, there is a certain amount of gratuitous violence for the sake of entertainment and, um, you know, uh, and, and, and shock and impact. And, and, and even in that, I believe that, you know, it, um, it has a value in the place that it is a satirical uh, presentation that's not meant to be yeah. reality and you know if you have a, a, a any kind of uh, show where you know you know characters can fly through the air or em emit electrical pulses that you know knock people over then you have to take the violence with the same degree um of of um uh, of acceptance you know yeah I agree. Even though I probably need therapy after watching the scene in the corporate <laughs> heads, um, that was something. Um, you've been really fortunate um, to be in a, a variety of projects that has that have really strong fan bases. Obviously, how much does Lord of the Rings mean to you after all these years when you got to do um, that that role, Yoma, and you're doing it at home in New Zealand? Uh, do you ever think back to that fondly? And what in particular do you love? Did you love about doing that that series? Lord of the Rings was unquestionably probably one of the highlights of my career and I was really kind of spoiled for the fact that it happened so early on I know. you know just to have the opportunity at that stage as a young actor to be working with the likes of Viggo Monson and Ian McKellen the great Sir Peter Jackson and just seeing how they would approach their craft 
Uh, and I learned so much through the process and I'm just so indebted uh, and, and grateful to have been a part of it. And I can never convey that enough, particularly to uh, Peter Jackson and, and, and Fran Walsh. Um, you know, it has left a lasting uh, legacy with me. Uh, and, um, you know, quite often I will think back, particularly, you know, at moments like when I'm a, about to work or when I am working, and I will think back to certain instances or, or experiences or things that I witnessed on that set, and they would inspire me uh, to, uh, to achieve more, to, to reach for a higher standard, uh, to mm. search for more choice. And, and I'll give you one example, actually. Yeah. I remember watching Vigo Mortensen shoot a scene uh, in one of the, the, the great Rohan Hall, uh, and he had a line of dialogue, night changes many thoughts. And I watched him do four or five takes. Every single take was different. Went from night changes many thoughts to night changes many thoughts. Night changes many thoughts. And he, he just went through a complete gambit, every variation that he could think of to give his director and to give the editor the luxury of choice. And I never forgot that. And I always strive to do the same, to give them that choice so that they can, in the editing of the show, um, you know, put the emphasis where they want it to be. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So, but yeah, ultimately it was, uh, it was just a once in a lifetime experience. And yeah, I'm re very grateful for it. It sounds like um, you learned how to be a, a team player. It, that the team involved in trying to get that thing off the ground, it, it probably stays with you. It brings me to Star Trek because for me that was one of the highlights. It was when that came out, and I was so dumb, honestly, so dumbfounded about your casting because it was so perfect. <laughs> I, I couldn't quite believe how much you had gotten the essence of McCoy right, but you made him your own. And I and I've always wondered. I've always wanted to ask you. Um, what was going through your head when you got that role and you obviously want to do both? You want to get the essence right. He's an iconic character, but you did make him your own. So what was going on there? Listen, I, I just full disclosure, uh, there were days where I would come off that set it completely in a state of panic <laughs> and, <laughs> and anxiety because I was fully aware that, you know, these are iconic characters and the work that DeForest Kelly um, had done, his contribution to Star Trek is immense. You know, he came on uh, in the first season and through the caliber of his work was quickly elevated to, you know, number three on the show. And, um, you know, the task was to present a younger version of that character in an alternate timeline and have that character be recognizable uh, to, you know, the, the, the great character that um, DeForest Kelly had played, but in the same sense also to make him my own. So for me, it was very, very much an exercise in, um, in trying to uh, identify and convey the very essence of, of what that was. Um, but then obviously, you know, still, you know, make my own. And, and, and that was the challenge. And I think that, you know, everybody across the board uh, in the cast um, rose to the occasion. Um, you know, Chris Pine isn't playing, you know, William Shatner's Kirk, but there is an essence, there is a flavor, just enough of a hint of, of William Shatner in there for it to be identifiable and for you immediately as an audience member to go, I'm on board with this ride. Yeah. I think it was 2009. From that, that was the best movie of that year. And I hope we're going to see more. I want to see more of the boys. I want to see more of everything. I really appreciate your time today, Carl. Good luck in your next project. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for your, your time and energy. And, and I just want to thank all the, the fans of the boys out there. And, you know, we couldn't be more delighted with um, the response to the show. And we can't wait to get back on set and work on season three and, and deliver you even more of the boys. So thank you. Thank you.